This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Hello and welcome to the explanation from the BBC World Service. This is where we press pause on the busy 24-hour news cycle and dig a bit deeper behind the headlines. Today the West Bank's nightmare started coming true. Protesters were throwing bricks in there, using bamboo poles to smash vehicles. It's a city where mothers carry guns along with their groceries. The spaces that people can run to for safety are shrinking every day here. Hello, I'm Claire Graham, and with the help of my colleagues around the world, I'll be trying to get a better understanding of the stories that matter to all of us. Today, Russia and Ukraine. What has bound them together and blown them apart. As a correspondent with the BBC for over 30 years, Kevin Connolly reported from all over the world, including Eastern Europe. Russia has, of course, deep cultural, economic and political ties with Ukraine. So, Kevin, where should we start to explore the relationship between the two countries? All of this starts off with a political entity called the Kievan Rus. Now, that is a huge stretch of land in the Middle Ages created by traders coming down from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. They create this huge imperial area which includes the territories which are modern Russia, modern Belarus and modern Ukraine. There are no nation states and there's no concept of a nation state at this point. But when Russians like Vladimir Putin look back into history, they see this common route. By the end of the 18th century, borders in Eastern Europe were dramatically reconfigured. The partitions of Poland, which brought three separate divisions of the country, culminated in Russia incorporating large stretches of the territory and increasing its imperial might. We have to try to think of this whole eastern part of Europe stretching far over towards Siberia as being an area of imperial possession. So for very, very long periods of history, there are no nation states, but there are national minorities. There is always a Ukrainian people. For many, many hundreds of years, there is a great Ukrainian capital of Kiev, but there is not a Ukrainian nation-state. And at the time when Poland is being carved up by its powerful imperial neighbours, it comes into the Russian Empire and essentially from that point on, the future of the Ukrainian people is bound up with Russian power. The two world wars which convulsed Europe in the first half of the 20th century resulted in the map of the continent being radically redrawn, first as a result of the Treaty of Versailles drawn up by the Allied powers in 1919. Three great empires collapsed simultaneously. Austro-Hungary, Germany and Russia. And in Russia you have the added complication of the October Revolution, Mm -hmm. which is happening in parallel with all of this. So all of a sudden, a Europe of empires becomes a Europe of nation states. But again, at this critical period, Ukraine loses out again. A vast civil war is being fought inside the Russian Empire, where the Bolsheviks, the communists, are slowly gaining control. And when they have control, they also have control of Ukraine. And in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union expected its crucial role in the conflict to be formally acknowledged in the subsequent resettlement of Europe. Stalin is determined to have a reward, and so essentially the Second World War ends up with the victorious allies, Britain, France, the United States and the others, essentially allowing Stalin to inflict military occupation on the whole of Eastern Europe. So countries like Poland do not become part of the Soviet Union, but become very unwilling satellite communist states of the Soviet Union. Ukraine remains part of the Soviet Union. It has been devastated by German military occupation and by the very heavy fighting between Soviet and German forces, 
to liberate Ukraine. And I think if you were alive in 1945 at what we now understand, I think, to be the height of Soviet power, I think it would never have seemed, if you were a Ukrainian, that there was going to be ever any chance of statehood or independence. There is one exception to this tightening grip of Soviet domination in Ukraine when Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, transferred power in the opposite direction to strengthen what he called the brotherly ties between the Ukrainian and Russian peoples. So in 1954, Khrushchev looks back into the history books and sees a treaty signed in 1654 which brought the Ukrainian Cossacks under the Russian military orbit. And he thinks, well, here's a historical anniversary that's worth marking. And what could be a better way of marking 300 years of of commonality, of common history, than by taking the Crimea, this beautiful stretch of land, and transferring it out of Russian Soviet governance into Ukrainian Soviet governance. But in 1954... That doesn't really matter because both Russia and Ukraine are simply constituent parts of the Soviet Union. But like a lot of things which are done in history without a great deal of thought or care, it does turn out to have Mm -hmm. long-term consequences that people at the time couldn't foresee, or at least didn't foresee. But it's not until nearly half a century later and the collapse of the Soviet Union that Ukrainian status will fundamentally change. Mr Gorbachev addressed his people tonight for the final time as their leader. With his first sentence, he told them that his presidency was over. Just a few minutes after he had finished his television address, the red flag was lowered. This was the view of its descent from inside the Kremlin. The hammer and sickle was hastily taken away. I think those of us who were there in 1991, 1992, were aware that something of enormous historical significance had happened in front of our eyes. The Soviet Union has been struggling economically, has been struggling politically, has lost its way, has attempted under Mikhail Gorbachev to reform itself so that it can somehow generate the economic power and energy to keep going. But essentially, that turns out to be a lost cause. The game is up. Communism has run out of intellectual energy. The country has run out of economic force. The constituent republics, many of them, most of them, just don't want to be under communist central control from Moscow, including Ukraine. Boris Yeltsin flew into Alma Ata in buoyant mood. He had come to bury the Soviet Union and to build the new Commonwealth. Much to his pleasure, 11 republics turned up in all. The 11 took part in a signing ceremony that makes them all co-founders of the Commonwealth, first devised a fortnight ago by Russia, Belarusia, and Ukraine. This will not be a single state, rather a collection of individual independent countries, which hope they'll now get international recognition, perhaps within a few days. At an extraordinary moment, at the end of 1991, the leaders of Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, and here we are right back with the areas and territories that made up the Kievan Rus in the Middle Ages. It's the leaders of those three Soviet republics who get together in a forest meeting house in Belarus in the countryside and they decide that the Soviet Union is dissolved. And from that point in December 1991, those places which had been Union republics of the Soviet Union, like Belarus, like Ukraine, all of a sudden become nation states. And Ukraine is born not just as a nation, but as a really big nation, far bigger than France, for example. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, many Russian politicians, including Vladimir Putin, who became president in 2000, viewed the loss of Ukraine as a threat to Russia's status as one of the great global powers. This fear was heightened further by the defeat of Viktor Yanukovych in the 2004 Ukrainian presidential election by the pro-NATO and European integration candidacy of Viktor Yushchenko. 
During the presidential campaign, Yushchenko became seriously ill in an apparent assassination attempt by poisoning. Mass protests, which became known as the Orange Revolution, followed a second contest in which Yanukovych was declared the winner. The Supreme Court invalidated the results and ordered a runoff, after which Yushchenko was officially confirmed as president. Putin's real fear is that Ukrainians are gravitating towards the European Union, towards NATO, towards democracy, to put it in its most simple terms, to look westwards and not to look northwards or eastwards. And Putin can't really take the risk that it will be obvious to his own people that Ukrainians are making another and better choice, turning their back on, on that sense of Russianness and shared identity and saying, no, we want that European Union version of life, that NATO version of life, that Western democracy version of life. As an independent nation, we are free to make that choice. Vladimir Putin is saying they're not free to make that choice. Viktor Yanukovych was re-elected in 2010 and three years later, under pressure from Moscow, he scrapped plans to formalise a closer economic relationship with the EU. Protests ensued, which resulted in Yanukovych fleeing the country. In response to the unrest, Vladimir Putin ordered a covert invasion of Crimea. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. In the imperial splendor of the Palace of the Tsars, a defiant President Putin entered to a fanfare. Today in the Kremlin, the historic seat of power, he was expanding Russia's borders for the first time in 70 years, welcoming back a former jewel in the crown of the Russian Empire. With the MPs applauding him time and again, he accused the West of being irresponsible, aggressive and hypocritical over Ukraine. But he promised he wasn't interested in annexing any more territory. I want you to hear me, dear friends. Don't trust those who frighten you about Russia, those who say Crimea will be followed by other regions. We don't want Ukraine to be split. So, in 2014, Putin is establishing the idea that he has the right to some areas of Ukrainian territory. Russia sends in what have become known with this rather grim jocularity as the little green men. Mm -hmm. He sends soldiers which, uh, whose uniforms bear no military insignia, no regimental markings, no numbers, no identifiers, in other words, and he annexes the Crimea. Now... A lot of Russians are quite comfortable with the idea that the Crimea is naturally theirs rather than naturally Ukrainian. But I do think that Vladimir Putin was testing the metal of the Western alliance. If he seized a part of Ukraine, what would the United States do? What would NATO do? And the answer is there are some sanctions, but they don't really amount to very much. So he's entitled to feel that he rather gets away with the annexation of Crimea. A plume of smoke rising into the sky in eastern Ukraine this afternoon. Local people here saying it was a plane which had just crashed. There is no confirmation this was the Malaysian airliner which came down with almost 300 people on board. In July 2014, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur was shot down while flying over eastern Ukraine. There's no doubt that that civilian aircraft was shot down by either Russian rebels with pretty strong and pretty close backing from the official Russian military, possibly even by the Russian military itself. It's a pretty sophisticated anti-aircraft missile system which shoots down the civilian airliner. It is, of course, a mistake or a miscalculation. They may have thought they were shooting at a Ukrainian transport aircraft. But in either case, again, it shows you a degree of impunity by simply denying and denying and denying. Russia will feel that its rebels, its separatist forces, its own 
armed forces, whoever did it precisely, they have got away with that. We saw Ukraine's army fire heavy artillery towards Dibaltseva. For months, pro-Russian rebels have held much of the land here, a conflict in which hundreds of civilians have died. Now the Ukrainian army is on the offensive. This is as far as we're able to go. There's been fierce fighting in towns and cities in this part of eastern Ukraine, particularly around the strategically important city of Donetsk. And it's the Ukrainian government forces that have been making advances, generally speaking in that direction, towards the crash site of flight MH17. In his support for separatists in southeastern Ukraine, another region home to large numbers of ethnic Russians and Russian speakers, Vladimir Putin referred to the area as Novorossiya, New Russia, a term dating back to 18th century Imperial Russia. Russia continued to officially deny its involvement in the conflict in the Donbass region until it launched its wider invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Until early this morning, some here in Kiev doubted that he would do it. Not anymore. The West warned Vladimir Putin was about to attack. He said he had no such plans. That fiction now utterly exposed. This is a calculation by Vladimir Putin, informed not by a real study of history, of course, but by raiding the history books to look for examples and metaphors and moments in history which in his distorted interpretation of the past provide a justification for him to do what he's doing in the present day. It's a lesson to all of us that when you study history, it should be with the honest intention of finding out what really happened and not with the intention of fueling your own modern day sense of grievance or justification. You've been listening to The Explanation on the BBC World Service with me, Claire Graham. My guest today was Kevin Connolly. And if you'd like to hear more episodes of The Explanation, subscribe now on BBC Sounds. The documentary is just one of our BBC World Service podcasts. There are many others to choose from. Hi, I'm Namla Takombo, and I was the winner of the BBC World Service's first international podcast competition. So are you ready? Have you got your tissues ready then? I think so. <laughs> In my podcast, people from around the world tell us about the letters they would like to send to their daughters. The more you keep to yourself, the less you learn. Between us, we've created a handbook to life for daughters everywhere. I would encourage her to be brave enough and make her mistakes if she wants to. It's called Dear Daughter and every episode is available now. We're opening the doors of the cages and we're, we're letting them out. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Right. Fly, bird, fly. <laughs> Dear Daughter, from the BBC World Service. Search for Dear Daughter wherever you get your podcasts.